even though you've already included the full quote in your paragraph. Crucially, students are never asked to respond personally to a piece of writing. They are asked to critically respond. What is their position on the author's words? The rubric enforces this idea of rigorous application to the text. Students are scored on writing focused non-summary topic sentences, including specific references back to the quotation and explaining all evidence critically and creatively. With these scoring criteria, a student cannot respond to the assignment with a personal, I disagree with the poem, and is forced to evaluate the words. In discussion, anchor all students' ideas in relation to the content. An example, what do you see in the content that makes you think so? And move on from students who present ideas without evidence. The results are usually impressive and exciting. One student, Casey, responded to this quotation assignment by connecting Harjo's use of the word punctuated to industrialization. Quote, when Harjo writes, the ocean floor will be punctuated by Chevy trucks. What speaks most to me is that Harjo is conveying that the ocean floor won't simply be temporarily affected by human industrialization and impacts, but the ocean floor will be permanently destructed by us. It will be punctuated and significantly impacted in the long run. So Casey emphasizes that the effects on the ocean floor are not temporary from one moment of driving a truck, but connects that its effects are permanent and to be considered in the long run. Another student, Isaiah, focuses his topic sentence on the big picture stakes, quote, an invisible fish by Joy, Har Joy Harjo. Joy gives us a terrifying insight of what our oceans could potentially turn into if we don't do something, change is needed now. Isaiah later posits that Harjo's poem is meant to, quote, scare us into reality. It's a bone position for a student practicing paragraph writing for homework. Cheyenne focused on the meaning of invisible in the title and first line, quote, invisible fish swim this ghost ocean. I believe Joy uses the word invisible to describe the fish because there are hundreds of millions of fish all over the world in our oceans and humans may not know where each and every fish is or we may not know each and every specimen of fish, which makes them easily forgettable. I think for humans especially, if we cannot see them, we do not care about them. For example, if we can't see the problem right in front of our face, we do not care about the problem. Cheyenne, while using first person very casually, still manages to maintain her focus on the critical word invisible and explain its connection to her idea. She ultimately ends her paragraph about humanity's affection for Starbucks instead of the world around us. Another student, Andrea, immediately focused on the human environmental impact in Sherman Alexie's powwow at the end of the world. She writes, Sherman Alexie's poem demonstrates that he doesn't accept that money makers modified the unique nature of his homeland to commercial and industrial zones for profit. Cities, broken dams, and reactors were built in his homeland, changing its uniqueness. These are all man-made projects that are built for profit and he doesn't accept it. He says, I must forgive. Who must he forgive? He doesn't want to forgive money makers for taking his original homeland away and turning it into commercial and industrial zone to make a profit on it. Andrea took a very strong position on the economic power of the cities, dams, and reactors the conversation easily evolved in class to include human impact on the environment and climate change. Faced with only evidentiary ways to respond and contribute, students tend to take positions on the environment and climate change's effects on the human condition and psyche, rather than argue over the science. For the research essay unit on the Sundance winning film, Beasts of the Southern Wild, Students answered the question, what commentary does the film, Beasts of the Southern Wild, offer on society? Why and how do you know? Nothing was overtly stated in class to encourage that this was a climate change unit. Instead, the imagery in the film of glaciers crashing and aurochs, magical prehistoric mammals, breaking out of the ice and running to stormy Louisiana to visit Wink and his five-year-old daughter, Hush Puppy, spoke enough climate change. The film's natural intersections to place, class, family relationship, domestic violence, civil rights, sexuality, 
and the slow violence that is perpetuated on small coastal communities offered enough counter narratives that students did not feel trapped. This lets students follow their own interests, which is especially rewarding for the non-science students. One student, Mackenzie, told me after watching Beast that it was a really great school movie. What followed were creative critical takes on the future. And even with that open-ended prompt, many if not most did engage with the climate disaster in the film. One student acknowledged that climate change is never directly addressed in the film, but opined creatively that the health of Wink, the father, and the health of the planet are intricately connected, saying, in the movie, Beasts of the Southern Wild, it hints at the growing problem of climate change. It never directly talks about it, but with all the talk of a big storm, icebergs, and rising temperatures, you can get the feeling that it is having a large impact on the people of the bathtub and their way of life. The myth of the aurochs brings both of these ideas together as they connect the declining health of Wink and the declining health of the planet. Another student in a different class had a similar idea. Quote, Wink's illness is used as a parallel for the effects that climate change has on the community in Hush Puppy. The trope of Wink, the dying parent, represents the different aspects of the slow violence of climate change in a direct and immediate way. This student suggested that Wink is connected intimately to nature and that leaving his young child behind in death is what will happen to all of us in the real world when climate disasters continue to impact our lives in deadly ways. Yet other students took positions on Hush Puppy and her connection to the aurochs to track the film's take on climate change. Two students focused on Hush Puppy's imagination and magical realism, quote, as a result from the personal experiences Hush Puppy has faced, she uses the imagination she creates for herself as a coping mechanism. And that student immediately went to the prehistoric aurochs as evidence in their first body paragraph. Another student says, the magic that Hush Puppy believes in in the film Beast of the Southern Wild helps her cope with the struggles she experiences throughout the film. Other students use the aurochs as a metaphor for Hush Puppy's growth in spite of her struggles, saying the auroch myth also teaches Hush Puppy to appreciate what she has, where she fits in, and that she is strong regardless of where she comes from. That student's paper focused on the aurochs as a mean to connect climate change with the child abuse she suffered at the hands of her father. Harrison considered the intersection of poverty and climate change in his thesis. Beast of the Southern Wild shows dysfunction, chaos, and extreme poverty in their small community while using magical realism to emphasize the problems of climate change today. Harrison's paper considered the implications of the impoverished island, the bathtub, as related to climate change, the big storm in the film, and how magical realism helped make this palatable for a wide audience. Still, other students chose not to focus on climate change, but on the paternal daughter relationship, poverty, or child abuse. Their thesis sentences include the following ideas. The film, Beasts of the Southern Wild, demonstrates how loss and suffering can shape strength, courage, and perseverance in an individual like Hush Puppy. That was in an essay titled, What There Is to Gain from Pain. Alondra connected survival skills to the five-year-old protagonist in Poverty State saying Hush Puppy learns such survival skills thanks to her father, Wink, and thus the idea of survival is shown through struggles and differences within the island and poverty. Lauren connected the father figure to addiction, saying Beast of the Southern Wild enhances the relationship of a single dad, Wink, in a tough situation, trying to rise to the occasion of being a leader while also trying to be a good father, but struggling with addiction and ultimately failing. Although none of these thesis sentences mention climate change, Inevitably, all of their essays ended up mentioning the extreme storm and flooding disaster as important pieces of evidence in their arguments. Our opportunity is to provoke students into new thoughts and skills, and there is a way to do so without challenging all of their previous held beliefs. It is to keep connected to the core curriculum that they expect from your class. Writing, sentence construction, critical analysis, making connections. I have concluded that as long as you hold yourself as firmly focused in these areas, it is more difficult for students to take a personal approach. After all, academic writing, while personal to the student, is not a personal format. The deft and gentle questioning from a composition instructor can encourage these ideas and with the right content, 
challenge students' preconceived notions while simultaneously nurturing their writing talent. At the end of the day, I truly can't recall one classroom conversation that devolved into an angry debate about the existence of climate change, because there's simply no room for it within the tight context of a rigorous writing assignment and rubric. The best way that we can serve our students is to support their burgeoning writing skills while encouraging the personal growth that we hope is at work in all of our college students. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katie. Um, next up, we have Annalise Norman, who is a PhD candidate in the English department at the University of Georgia. Her research interests include materiality in 18th and 19th century British literature. She's currently working on a dissertation about the social and material dynamics of the Vauxhall Pleasure Gardens as they appear in four British novels between 1778 and 1848. Please welcome Annalise Norman. Thanks, John. Thanks for that intro. Um, it's going to be cool to see how <laughs> my paper fits in with um, with, you know, all the other stuff that's going to be happening this morning. Um, cause I could talk about teaching all day and honestly, and Katie, your presentation made me want to just completely <laughs> just do pedagogy. Um, but for, for today, uh, my paper is called, is this a place for Miss Anvil, Francis Bernie's Evelina and the Vauxhall Pleasure Gardens. So Vauxhall made its way into the social plots of 18th century British novels as a site of urban leisure, spectacle, and intrigue. Leased to and restored by Jonathan Tyres in the late 1720s, the Pleasure Gardens attracted fashionable and affected crowds of both the upper and middle classes. During its 18th century heyday, Vauxhall was only open on summer nights, weather permitting, and it featured long walks, supper boxes, and a rotunda, where regularly rotating entertainers and exhibitions helped to sustain public interest. As the actions of literary characters who visited the space suggest, Vauxhall provided countless opportunities for advancement in terms of conflict or personal agenda, solicited or unsolicited sexual conquest, and the confusion of status in the crowd's mixing of classes. Frances Burney offers perhaps one of the most memorable literary depictions of social mixing at Vauxhall in her 1778 novel, Evelina, or The History of a Young Lady's Entrance into the World. Burney emphasizes the licentiousness of Vauxhall's reputation in her staging of Evelina's social education at the Pleasure Gardens. In this essay, I'll start with a brief description of the gardens to help us get oriented with the space, and then I'll trace Evelina's experience at the Pleasure Gardens, paying close attention to her dangerous encounters with riotous men in the dark walk, and analyzing her naivete as a means for determining the garden's capacity to influence its visitors' trajectories and experiences in order to investigate the affordances of the Pleasure Gardens, both natural and man-made, that seem to inform visitors' occupation of the space. Vauxhall's garden walks were designed to support and encourage social mixing with their crisscross pattern, which caused several paths to intersect. The outdoor, setting, the outdoor setting and layout of the gardens promoted varied interaction across class boundaries as the walks corralled guests at their numerous intersections to form a diverse, mobile, throbbing crowd. The mixing of society and thronging of visitors in this public space promoted a confusion advantageous for social and sexual predators. For the new or infrequent visitor, spontaneous encounters were a reasonable expectation, one that Bernie adopts in choreographing Evelina's Vauxhall visit. Hannah Grieg has, de has defined Vauxhall as a public space based on accessibility and its encouragement of certain social behaviors. Though Vauxhall was accessible to all who could afford the one shilling admission, fashionable elites upheld their characteristic exclusivity by populating certain areas of the gardens and visiting during selective times. Deep pockets and customary entertainment brought the Beaumont to Vauxhall with such a frequency that they would quickly learn the layout of the gardens so they could begin to capitalize on its spatial delineations. These elites were able to shield themselves from the theoretical mixing and mingling that attracted lower class visitors behind the functions of zoning. So for example, supper boxes were available only to those who could pay the exorbitant price for concessions. 
Grieg notes, quote, Vauxhall's famously overpriced refreshments may have quickly racked up the bill for the unwary, suggesting that further layers of financial division may have operated within the grounds, distancing those who supped and those who did not, end quote. Though anyone who could swing the shilling price of admission could enjoy the gardens, not all had complete access to Vauxhall's offerings. In the financial tiering of the Pleasure Garden experience, Vauxhall supported the elite's imposing of class distinction and encouraged their congregation in these exclusive zones. This practice of defensive sociability derived from an education on the sorts of activities that occurred in the secluded or poorly lit nooks of public gathering spaces. Apprised of the spatial affordances that supported these activities, the elites could either act on these opportunities or avoid them. Regardless of the decision being made about how to conduct oneself in a space like Vauxhall, the social expectation and understanding is that all of these are informed decisions to act. This proves to be a hard lesson for some who, like Evelina Anvil, are making a first entrance into the world with inadequate guidance. One of the ways in which Bernie explores the limitations of Evelina's social education is by resigning the 17-year-old to a company of mixed morals and notions of propriety for her first visit to Vauxhall. A certain amount of social knowledge was required for a woman to navigate the garden safely without endangering one's reputation. Having never been to the gardens, Evelyn is not aware of the hierarchical organization of Vauxhall. While she understands the importance of keeping close to her company, she doesn't demonstrate an awareness of the social security afforded by the supper box her party dines in. Beyond the supper boxes that the Brangton brood, that's the family she's stuck with at this point in the story, conspicuously dines in lies the social map imposed upon the rest of the gardens. There are performers on display, sex workers soliciting business, rakes stalking their prey, and deviants who've laid claim to the shadows, just as the Beaumont has colonized the supper boxes. Of course, Evelina doesn't realize that the respectable elites are not the only ones who have located and claimed an enclave of entertainment for themselves. After dining in their supper box, Evelina's cousins decide to take a little pleasure and make their way to the dark walks, naturally. Evelina reluctantly joins her cousins on their walk around the gardens without their gentleman chaperones to escape the unwanted attentions of one of her own party, the cringy Mr. Smith. Though Evelina does not fully conceive of the garden's social or geographical landscape, she's familiar enough with her party to exercise some caution at the Miss Frankton's notions of entertainment. But of course, she finds herself in the dark walks, quote, quite by compulsion, as she followed them down a long alley in which there was hardly any light, end quote. Unsurprisingly, though to Evelina's terror, the girls encounter a large, riotous party of gentlemen loitering at the end of the lane. When the two parties meet, the men detain the girls, simultaneously imprisoning them and forcing them into a weird dance-like spectacle. Evelina recalls how the men, quote, seem to rush suddenly from behind some trees and, meeting us face to face, put their arms at their sides and formed a kind of circle that first stopped our proceeding and then our retreating, for we were presently entirely enclosed, end quote. It seems that these men were lying in wait, ready to act upon any opportunity that appeared at this dark end of the walk. The men respond to the women's screams with laughter, detached from the reality of the terror they imposed by forcing the women into a spectacle. Evelina manages to break free from the ruffians, only to find herself in the midst of a second group of gentlemen enjoying the shadows. It's in this new disorienting throng that Evelina is mistaken for an actress. Now, these men mistake Evelina for a sex worker, though it's not clear if they genuinely believe she's an actress looking to supplement her income or if it's a label of convenience and opportunity. By the publication of this scene in Bernie's first novel, it was common knowledge that actresses often had to perform sex work to supplement their income. But the generic conventions of the female building's Roman also require a relatively naive protagonist who could easily find herself in this predicament without knowing these implications. So without fully comprehending the design of Vauxhall and expected behaviors of each delineated area, Evelina cannot be certain of the dangers that lurk behind every corner. Critics have noted how Evelina perceives some threats to her person and virtue, but she doesn't really know the specific or what forms they might take. 
Susan Staves remarks upon the imprecision with which Evelina attempts to describe the threat she feels while alone in Sir Clement's presence, asking, quote, how could she know what Sir Clement wants to do to her in her state of innocence? Mary Poovey has argued that, quote, if a woman indicated any sense that she had had a knowledge of the world or of her own sexuality, even just by blushing, then she might lose men's protection and instead be considered their ready prey, end quote. So Evelina's pressure to remain simultaneously ignorant of the threats and wary of how these nameless dangers could manifest at any time in public assembly spaces. By this logic, she is expected to determine what conditions could best support these unknown dangers, what she can only presume to be murder, and promptly avoid them. Many of Bernie's other Vauxhall visitors take full advantage of the landscape darkness and seclusion, as we see in Sir Clement Willoughby's attempted removal of Evelina to yet another dark space. Evelina's rescue from the first group of men by Sir Clement does not remove the capitalist consumer context that's mapped onto the gardens, only Evelina's mistaken identity. No longer can Sir Clement's actions be conflated with the traditional illusions and confusion of identities that Vauxhall provides because he recognizes her. Instead, he takes full advantage of the garden's dark periphery, dragging Evelina to a part of the walk, quote, where we shall be least observed, end quote, where Evelina would be subjected to his aggressive advances. Evelina does resist Sir Clement, indignantly asking him, quote, do you suppose I'm to be thus compelled? Do you take advantage of the absence of my friends to affront me? End quote. Though Sir Clement has already experienced Evelina's innocence, he ignores, or really he capitalizes on, the fact that she's lost her companions to determine that her presence in the dark walk signifies her sexual availability. Solicitation and pleasurable consumption are built into the architecture and sustained in the cultural memory of the space. The garden's geography reflected the 18th century consumer revolution in which people acquired more material possessions and leisure experiences than ever before. As Miles Ogburn had suggested, Vauxhall's culture of conspicuous consumption did not exclude promiscuity. Exploring the relationships between commodification, sexuality, and visual illusion, Ogborn argues, quote, that Vauxhall's walks and shades were heavy with sexual tensions that cannot be separated from the fact that the space within which they were placed was one that was constructed through commodification and commercialization, end quote. These established notions of pleasure garden commerce materialized as an affordance of the dark walk. It's not just that the dark the, the dark walk <laughs> the dark walk provided the conditions for these kinds of solicitations, but that these opportunities are built into society's estimations of the space's purpose and function. In this way, conspicuous consumption encompasses commerce and sex. Greg reflects on this custom, which clearly pay, plays a role in Evelina's experience in the dark walk. Quote, the personages present were unknowable and complicit in a world of falsified appearances. Here, if anywhere, it was believed that the prostitute could present herself as a purist and the rake as a respectable man, end quote. Beyond the garden's capacity for deception, Greeks' evocation of the prostitute and the rake, stock figures of Vauxhall from the 18th century, it gestures at the possibility for decades of remembered institutions to be reimposed upon the gardens, quietly influencing the customs, behaviors, and inhabitations of its spaces at any given moment. History assigns meaning to the space and colors its entertainment offerings, while the lively landscaping and architecture exert a strange power over the visitor's experience. Simply following the paths specifically designed for mixing and mingling with the diverse crowd of the gardens, Evelina doesn't possess an awareness of or experience in the gardens to know to resist the supposed natural order of the landscape. Seasoned visitors recognize the affordances as either threats or opportunities built into the notion of going to Vauxhall for an evening's entertainment. Uncovering the unspoken attractions of Vauxhall's various zones of amusement reveals the conditions and reasons for Evelina's traumatic experience. Evelina is endangered by her ignorance of the space's social organization and her separation from her party. Her only means of procuring safety is to return to the populated, better lit area of the garden. So she emerges from the dark walk with a greater working knowledge of the space she and, this, she and the Miss Brangtons explored and its accompanying dangers. 
This knowledge informs her concern for her cousins as they have not yet returned. She writes, quote, I grew extremely uneasy for the Miss Branktons, whose danger, however imprudently incurred by their own folly, I too well know how to tremble for, end quote. As Evelina reflects in her letter to Mr. Villers, her party is acutely aware of her ignorance, depending upon it for amusement during their visit. Her companions are familiar with the space, and they wish to see it challenge and consume Evelina's innocence. Social predators are not relegated to the shadows in Vauxhall. As Evelina realizes, quote, my surprise and ignorance proved a source of diversion to them all that was not exhausted the whole evening, end quote. For this group, Evelina is another Vauxhall pleasure, another spectacle to be enjoyed in the space. But while they revel in her ignorance, Evelina's companions paradoxically hold her accountable for the social knowledge she doesn't have or shouldn't have considering the standards for female virtue and expectations of vulnerable innocence that prohibit a young woman's awareness of sexuality and desire. Joanne Cutting Gray goes so far as to suggest that, quote, the patriarchal model for female virtue appears to posit innocence merely in order to assault it, end quote. Mr. Brinkton, a man, suggests that Evelina sought out the attentions of her attackers, asking, quote, what had you to do in the long alleys? Why, to be sure, you must all of you have had a mind to be affronted, end quote. Compounding this paradoxical accountability, cringy Mr. Smith assigns coyness to Evel Evelina's ignorance of Vauxhall's amusements. As Evelina becomes increasingly familiar with these patterns of male thought, she reflects on Sir Clement's behavior towards her in the different setting of the dark walk. Sir Clement, quote, seems disposed to think that the alteration in my companions authorizes an alteration in his manners, end quote, when it becomes clear that she has changed hands from the respectable Mervins to the coarse Brangton family. In the spirit of satire, Bernie pits patriarchal ideology against utterances of masculinity to illustrate the, the impossible position of an innocent, naive young woman assumes when she is introduced into a new high stakes public context. From Evelina's terrifying and cringeworthy experiences at Vauxhall, we discover the importance of both where one is located within the gardens and the company one keeps amongst the threats of the space. Thank y'all. Thank you, Annalise. Um, next up, we have Kim Kimberly Bernhardt, who is a clinical associate professor in New York University's expository writing program, where she teaches writing in first year seminars examining the impact of climate change on cities. Before coming to NYU, she taught composition and literature at Rutgers University. Western Washington University and Montclair State University. She received a PhD in literature from Rutgers University. Her research interests include environmental humanities, higher education, composition, modern and co contemporary poetry and literary theory. She has also served as a faculty affiliate working with residents in NYU's outdoor community. She grew up in Eugene, Oregon and currently resides in NYC. Please welcome Kimberly Bernhardt. Hi, everyone. Um, one connection I did notice between our three presentations is that we're all talking about place in some way or that place matters to it. Um, Annalise, just one comment. I would have loved to see a map. I would. So anyway, I'll start presenting now. I'm going to share my screen um, because I have a few slides. I want to make sure I go um, to the right spot first. So hold on one second. Sorry to slow down with that. Um, there. Okay. And okay, can you all see the slides? Good. Okay, just let me know if they don't move. All right. Um, so I'm Kim Bernhard and I'm presenting on using personal connections to empower student writing on climate change. Um, and I may have one there. Okay. So in, um, and this is, this is really experiential. So I'm kind of telling a story about um, my experiences teaching over the past year. So in 2019, New York City felt like the center of climate activism, at least it did to those of us who, who were here. Um, Greta Thunberg led a massive crowd marching through Manhattan and New York City 
um, public schools allowed its 1.1 million students to walk out of class to attend. NYU students marched with them. And I'm gonna show up just a brief clip to show you what it felt like to be in this march where I, um, well, I'll start it. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Kimberly, I don't hear audio. Oh. oh, you don't have audio? Oh, dear. Let's see. Oh, thank you for telling me that. Hold on one second. Uh, I did practice this part. So um, let's see. I'm going to try it without the headphones, and perhaps that will work. All right, one more time. OK, I hope this works. If not, I'll just say it. Okay, so tell me if that's climate change process happening. Can you we hear, can it now? hear it now? Great. Okay, let's go back. Oops, that's not what I wanted to click. <laughs> okay, and I just have to move it forward a little bit, or else it gets too long. Action. There have been similar rallies happening all day long, all around the world, from New Jersey to Boston to even overseas in Paris. News Four's Jamie Roth live at the Battery. Jamie, what's it like out there now, where you are? Well, it, it's electric, actually, led by young people filling the streets, trying to raise awareness for climate change and get the attention of the adults in power. Tens of thousands marching down Broadway on the ground, energy and conviction. Our generation has been told time and time again that our lives do not matter and we have no historical purpose. We are out here today proving that wrong. School kids led the charge, walking out of class, demanding world leaders take action to prevent further global warming and climate change. We are witnessing the destruction of our planet. I feel powerful knowing that I am on the right side of history. 13 year old. Okay. Um, the atmosphere was really electric, and we were surrounded by so many students. As I marched alongside these thousands of students surrounded by their homemade signs and chants, I thought about this amazing opportunity. Here we had a city of students engaged in civic protest, making art, asking questions, feeling powerful, and wanting to make a difference. After the march, I began thinking about how I could use my teaching to support these students and more specifically about the way that the critical reading and writing skills that I teach might be useful to them in their activism. Since I teach first year writing, the, op the options for me and my students at NYU look limited. NYU's climate focused courses primarily offer either general introductions to the science that would help students understand climate change or they are upper division courses beyond the reach of my first year students. I designed a course to introduce first year students to basic climate science and its history in the US, and then to allow them to use that understanding as they examine the ways that climate science and climate change get represented in news, fiction, and art, and film. I don't wanna forget film. Um, I planned the course with those marching students in mind, envisioning a semester of discussions, author visits, and field trips to local sites, including the controversial construction site for the planned wall around Lower Manhattan, which has been really a site of contention. Um, Climate change oh, protests I'm happening sorry, right now in happens, Lower Manhattan. I've tried this a bunch of times. It still happens. Sorry. sorry. The class I taught was very different. Um, I'm assuming most of you were teaching in spring of you know, 20 and 21. Um, over half my students participated from their bedrooms outside of New York City. Those who did make it to campus were forced in and out of quarantine as possible exposures came and went. While I planned for a room of budding activists, I taught to a nearly empty room of mass students, each surrounded by six feet of open space. So while the questions that inspired my planning and preparation had focused on how to provide appropriate materials to help students make the most of their existing in engagement with the topic, the work of teaching climate related materials during the pandemic provided um, entirely different challenges. I didn't fully realize this. I think I was caught up a little too much in my own pandemic brain and surroundings. Um, I didn't fully realize this until I began reading my students' writing. Students' responses to many different materials at first turned our attention back to the pandemic. So everything connected to what we were experiencing right then. What had seemed our biggest threat, climate change, 
faded in the face of the pandemic that terrified and separated us all. A little too late, I realized the need to rethink my assumptions. I had assumed that my students would come to class excited, that we'd work our way through this understanding of the science, and then I'd let their interests guide our exploration. I'd prepared a reader filled with text sorted by genre and planned for us to make selections together. Then I'd planned to ask them to choose their research projects, or then I'd planned to ask them to choose research projects that connected to the things they were already fascinated by. Um, so instead, their responses to the materials we read were overwhelmingly bleak and looked back at the past as the time for action. Um, here's one student's writing, just to give you a sense of the, the tenor of, of what I was getting. Self-delusion is a constant and integral part of our lives, a survival tool we employ as we construct our own narratives of climate change. I think we delude ourselves daily, constantly, into believing that we are doing enough, that we can't be held accountable, that we will be okay, that we are good people. Could our egos not withstand our true laziness, our greed, our selfishness, our lack of compassion? Could our consciousness not bear the weight of our inaction, our evil? If there exists a reaction for every action, then there exists an elaborate excuse for every inaction. But when will our blankets of self-delusion wear thin? Will we remain hopelessly optimistic as our houses finally burn around us? Will we, not, will we still not blame ourselves when the tides swallow up our cities, taking us down with them? Another student wrote, maybe this is why we didn't tackle this problem as much as we should have, because trying meant possibly failing and not trying meant there was no way we could possibly fail. I think we wanted to be aware of the actions we could take, but not actually take them, because it could possibly not work out. Fear is the biggest motivator, and the fear of failure was much heavier than the fear of a possible destroyed future. Now, this is not what I was expecting at all. Um, and I, I, looking back, of course, I should have rethought my approach given how much had happened since I planned the class and when the class actually started. Um, it was almost a full year between proposing it, having it accepted and actually teaching it. And New York City went through hell during that time. And we had, um, you know, so we had, like most of the world, right? Um, it, was, it was very different. So, so while reading texts that were encouraging action and change, my students pointed backwards. The time for change, at least in their thinking, seem to have passed. So I tried adjusting again, and I turned us to what seemed to me to be more positive, practical responses to climate change. I was really, I mean, I think like, like most of us working with younger people, we were, you know, reaching for some kind of like, I don't know, it sounds, it sounds a little ridiculous to say, but some kind of light, some kind of inspiration for them at this time, since um, it seemed so terrible. So um, so I started looking at more kind of um, practical actions within New York City that we could actually like point to, you know, like, look out the window, look at that tree. <laughs> so we looked at New York City government and activist attempts to respond to warming, including planting street trees, encouraging the use of electric vehicles and flood prevention initiatives, and at the way these efforts were represented in the media and in the community. In the daily questions I asked students to submit about the readings, they still pointed us toward the hopelessness of our situation. Um, and this is this kind of sums up kind of the, you know, New York City writing about their um, the advantages of all these street tree plantings. Um, and you can see the list of like all the great things it just caused according to the New York City website. Um, so about street tree planting, a st student surveyed the materials which were positive and encouraging, noticed a flaw and asked, why would a high profile study suggest to plant trees when a lot of the land required for that is already in use? Does the idea of giving citizens false hope play a role in that study? That surprised me because I um, sort of expected everyone to be enthralled with the trees and just say like, oh, how fantastic we're getting all these new trees in this incredibly dense urban environment. Um, 
So this is a fascinating question. Like, I love that he asked this question on one side, but on the other half of me was like, even the trees, you know? So, so um, I did encourage him to consider it, but I still had a problem. If students felt that all possible discussions of climate change ended at despair or ended at skepticism, I didn't really know what we were gonna be doing for the rest of the semester. So I had to get them like finding their own um, sort of their own areas, their own research projects. And, and I worried about how I would do this given their responses. So I shifted my approach again, reaching for ways to engage them a little more personally. And I turned their attention to their own stories. So this is the next prompt I used in class. And I'm sure my students felt a little whiplash of going from sort of like my attempts one after another. So I told them to find a photo of a place that matters to you and paste it into a document. Then write sentences to describe this place. Tell us how it feels to be there. Include sensory details, how it smells, the sounds, tastes, etc. Write so that someone reading your description might be able to close their eyes and picture it. Give that reader a sense of how much you value this place and why. And my students were really able to do this so beautifully that it, um, it, I found it really moving at that time period, and I also really wanted to encourage it. So um, this is one of my students' pictures and that she found, you know, she found a picture of the place she selected. Um, and I'm gonna read her description. Eucalyptus, its sweet scent drifts on the ocean breeze, mixing with the thick tropical smell of sunscreen. In the turquoise water, swimmers glide, dive, bob letting the cool water slip across their skin. Sand clinks to skin, salt lingers in the air. We laze on our stomachs, browned and stinging from the hours spent pressed against our surfboards, riding set after set, day after day, surfing until dusk finally snubs the flame of the late afternoon sun, forcing us back to shore. Only then do we ever return home, bedraggled, aching, giddy, our wrinkled fingers clutching at our boards, our blistered feet dance across the burning asphalt as we share stories from the day's adventures. From the house, the sounds and smells of the night drift out. The song of the saxophone, the smell of food, the clink of wine glasses, the bubbles of laughter. The mozzies descend, the kookaburras watch. For our childhoods, Pearl Beach was less a place than a feeling. It meant safety, joy, family, friends, summer. It's where my heart wanders when I feel homesick. It's where my mind arrives when I think of Australia. Once they finish this descriptive writing, which I just found so heartening, right? It just, um, after the first month of class, it, it felt um, like a window opened in a way. Um, I asked them to begin researching their locations. Um, and this is the prompt. Now do research to discover the way that changes to the climate might impact this place. If the place you care about is particularly well insulated, you may have to look farther into predictions for the future. Consider sources from local government, what might be done to protect it, what controversies are involved in this work, and what questions do you want to ask about this situation? Um, in their in their writing after they did research in between this you know the place writing and the next writing they created an annotated bibliography and gathered gathered information and then they started to write it and this is the same students writing about this Australia is no stranger to fire known as the sunburnt country the land down under no scorching summers and blazing bushland. But the fire season of 2019-2020 was unprecedented. It burned millions of square kilometers and lasted many months longer than Black Saturday in 2009 or Ash Wednesday in 1983. The severity of these brush fires is a, or bush fires, sorry, is a function of the prolonged drought, high winds, low humidity, and increased temperatures, conditions that are worsened rapidly due to global warming. For many decades now, Australia has been affected, or afflicted, sorry, by a drying trend, with the southeast of the country 
in which Pearl Beach is located, experiencing a 12% decline in average rainfall since the late 1990s. Equally, Australia's climate has warmed by over one degree. Um, with the, sorry, Celsius since 1960, with the frequency of extreme heat events having increased roughly fivefold. As American climatologist, Dr. Michael Mann described it, take record heat, combine it with unprecedented drought in already dry regions, and you get unprecedented bushfires. It's not complicated. For the next assignment, students developed research questions. And here's another student's writing about the place she chose and her research question. Jones Beach, Long Island. I have found research about using seawalls, breakwaters, and bulkheads to reduce wave energy to protect properties behind them. But they cause erosion, deprive beaches of sediment, and destroy habitats for sea life. I then found that there's a place on Long Island that actually uses large boulders, planted grasses, and oyster reefs to disperse this wave energy without harm to the beaches themselves. The oyster reefs also created a new habitat for fish and provided oyster filtering to improve water quality. What I'm wondering is why this effective solution is not being implemented in other places as well. And instead, those places are still using the harmful and destructive seawalls and breakwaters. The students' descriptions and the research they did afterwards became our new starting point, grounding us in the work and the research papers that were to come. With this writing, we could pull discussions out of the abstract because students had concrete, immediate knowledge of a place and the authority to discuss the impacts of climate change on that place. With this authority and understanding, they could analyze their own experiences, their own responses, and then approach other aspects of the course as well. It was as if they gained their footing in some way, like they got their feet under them, if that makes sense, just through these personal connections. They switched from talking only about sort of um, the skepticism and despair to actually thinking about what kinds of projects work and don't work, what kinds of like sort of what kinds of things might be active and engaging for them. So it was a huge switch in the tenor of the class and in what was happening in the classroom. They had some authority to talk about these places they had selected. So they began to teach the other students in the class about the situations in those places and about the kinds of, of um, solutions that were being tried and about those controversies. So to think about why this worked to the extent that it did, because I don't in any way wanna say like all of a sudden my students were, were like hopeful and, and switch to, you know, kind of looking for, oh, what, so what can we do? Um, they were still, for the most part, sitting in their bedrooms, half of them in their home countries in the middle of the night, zooming in to, to make it to class. So anyway, to think about why this worked to the extent that I did, I asked them to read Zadie Smith's essay, Elegy for a Country Season, and write in response to this quote, which I just went past there. Um, and this is from the end of her essay. When she says, in the end, the only thing that could create the necessary traction in our minds was the intimate loss of the things we loved. Like when the seasons changed in our beloved little island, or when the lights went out on the 15th floor, or the day I went into an Italian garden in early July with its owner, a woman in her 80s, and upon seeing the scorched yellow earth and withered roses, and hearing what only the really old people will confess. In all my years, I've never seen anything like it. I found my mind finally beginning to turn from the elegiac, what have we done, to the practical, what can we do? This is not to say that my students suddenly became confident climate change activists, but that they began to speak after going through this process as if they could say something. And that was a big step from where we started. So thank you. And I see that someone wrote something in the chat. I hope it's I hope it's not something like turn it up. Oh, John, I just saw this. I'm so sorry. Okay. Oh, it's fine. You were within the two minutes that I oh, recorded. Good. Good. Uh, thank you so much. Um, our final panelist is Rachna Pandey, who is a PhD research scholar in the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences 
at Indian Institute of Engineering Science and Technology, Shibpur. She has worked as an assistant professor at Central University of Odisha. Avery Mukhopadhyay is an assistant professor of English. I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry if I pronounced that uh, incorrectly. Yeah, I, I would like to, uh, actually she is not here. Uh, she was one of my co-presenter earlier, but now she is not here, yeah. Oh, so uh, is it not necessary then to introduce? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, well, with that being said, um, please welcome uh, Rachna Pandey. Thank you, John. Thank you so much. And hello, everyone. Okay, so uh, I would like to share my screen. Is it visible? Okay. okay. So the title of this presentation is Women Quest for Identity in Ecology. Okay. So, so let me tell you uh, the introduction first that what is going uh, in your minds in the next 15 to 16 minutes. So first of all, um, I'm dealing with this topic that women's quest for agency and identity in ecology, where I will uh, take two of the uh, writings by, uh, by an author, that is Anuradha Roy, and the two of the characters from her different novels, that is Mira and Maya from An Atlas of Impossible Longing, and then The Folded Earth. So this is something about this presentation. So what is the objective of this presentation? First of all, uh, I would like to uh, examine the ineffectual attempts of women to find refuge in men and their attainment of agency and identity while unifying with environment or nature. Secondly, I would like to investigate the rationales of women's oscillation between agency, identity, and the lack of agency and identity. So, uh, first of all, let me tell you what ac uh, actually agency and identity is in a very simple words that uh, identity, as we all know, is an apparatus for human existence and knowledge of being, whereas agency provides channel for operation of people's will to make voluntary choices. So um, if we talk about these two concepts, identity and agency, in a feminist perspective, then uh, not only the uh, individual identity, but the collective identity of women is also very important. And as we all know that in this uh, scenario, in this world, the individuality, the agency and uh, identity is being denied and it is not being properly provided to women. And then we'll deal uh, with the post-colonial uh, post perspective of uh, identity and agency. And then the key of key part of this uh, presentation is the environmental perspective, where we'll deal with uh, the eco-feminist criteria, that how uh, Mira and Maya, they unify with nature and they uh, forbid from this forbidden world. So first of all, I would like to uh, talk about the essay by Gayatri Spivak that is, can the subaltern speak? Here we can see that the subaltern is women and here the double colonization comes into play. As in the third world, uh, people are being colonized, they are being subjugated, but the women there, women here, I must say, are being double colonized as uh, the different as, uh, perspective or aspects comes into play that is caste, creed, and then gender, several things. Then women feel a kind of otherness in this uh, situation here. So because of the uh, perennial subaltern subjugation, this double colonization takes, uh, takes into play. And then how women come out of this patriarchal shade is the question that how uh, in this uh, situation only where they are being subjugated and being marginalized, how they are coming out of this shade. So yes, the third world is the victim of colonial oppression as we all know, and the la lack of agency 
and denial of identity is one of the byproducts of colonial oppression, then yes, women are always being the sitting target for the dominating minds. Uh, next is the concept of environment or nature in this presentation that how nature and environment comes into play. Then I must say the uh, commonalities between women and nature that how we can connect both of them. First of all, uh, as we all know that women are being suppressed, they are being subjugated from the post-colonial perspective. But uh, when we talk about the Marxist perspective, then what is there that uh, the concept of industrialization, then capitalization, these, these are some of the ideas or concepts we can say, which, uh, which, which are responsible for the uh, domination or the exploitation of nature. So both the concept, the post-colonial and the Marxist concepts combined to give us the idea that yes, both women and nature are being, uh, are being subjugated and marginalized. So what next comes into play that why these, if these two women in nature are being subjugated, then what is the means to get, uh, to get out of it? What is their uh, idea of getting refuge? How do they find refuge? So then nature comes into play that yes, women find uh, nature as their best companion rather than men to share their feelings, to share their time with. So in the two in two of the novels that I have already mentioned, that is An Atlas of Impossible Longing and The Folded Earth, there are uh, many uh, women characters who embodied the same characteristics which I have mentioned. But the two characters, there are Mira and Maya, both of them uh, with the passage of time, they get a unification or they get unified with the nature and get their peace in life. So this is the idea of environment here. And when uh, I talk about the unification of women in nature, then one word comes into our mind that is ecofeminism. So ecofeminism, as we all know, is an activist and an academic movement that talks about the domination of uh, women and the exploitation of nature. And here are the uh, four major, I can say, ecofeminists. That is Vandana Shiva. She's from India and she is working hard in this area. Then Greta Gard. I would like to uh, quote something from Greta Gard that what is her idea of ecofeminism? Uh, ecofeminism is a nexus between, uh, sorry, nexus bringing together of an environmental perspective, species justice, female perspective, and entire racist perspective. So she is not only talking about. Uh, women, but she's talking about the entire races perspective, entire species perspective. So this is the um, this is the whole idea of ecofeminism that how women are standing for the conservation of nature. Then uh, there is Carol J. Adams. Her one of her uh, critical works that is the sexual uh, uh, the sexual politics of meat. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but as far as I remember, this is the work. And the sexual politics of meat, where she is talking about the uh, the politics which is going on in the society because of the uh, meat eating. And here is uh, one book I have that is The Vegetarian by Han Kang. Uh, here again, she is uh, South Korean, and she here in this uh, novel she is talking about the how uh, vegetarianism is an essential part to eradicate to. Uh, to eradicate the uh, exploitation which is being done to animals. So as uh, species justice is one of the part of ecofeminism, and here is a woman who is standing for, her, for the conservation of animal species also. And then uh, there is Bangari Mathai. She is an, uh, <clears throat> she is a Canadian, uh, sorry, she's a Canadian, uh, I guess, uh, uh, um, activist, yeah. And she's involved in Green Belt movement. And she's the one who uh, inspired many of the women of Kenya to stand and to plant trees. She's being also awarded the uh, Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, now I must come to the writer that is Anuradha Roy. And 
her uh, two of the novels again i'm mentioning and atlas of impossible longing and the folded earth so there are two characters mira and maya so there are some convergences bunch of convergences both the characters they were widows and in the very beginning of her lives they thought that the male shield will help them to come or to live their life smoothly but later they realized that the society is not giving them the enough space and enough uh i enough uh, position to exercise their powers and then they are not having any kind of agency and identity to exercise their will in the society or in the, in their even in their homes where they were living so uh, previously they were in a male, male shield but after the death of their husbands they were again uh, they don't have any sheltering tree we can say to guard them but when both of them uh, moved to a place where again society is ready to give them a sheltering tree they are ready to give them a men to fulfill their desires and to live their lives they denied that and later we we have uh, i have witnessed in the novel that they were the ones who unified with nature and get the peace in their lives for example this character mira uh, from an atlas of impossible longing she is very much uh, in love with the dogs in in her streets then she uh, she goes and they she feeds them every evening and she, uh, this is her schedule for every day she uh, she again then goes to a place where there were rivers there were trees and she find peace there rather than in the home where she was living this is the place where she is being uh, she feels that she is being respected and she is being loved by the dogs by the trees and by the uh, other natural entities present there so this is something about mira and then if we talk about maya then she is again a woman a widow then she moved to a place that is rani khet that is again in india only uh, a place which is uh, far from the urban life that is a very uh, secluded place and a very natural full of nature that place is but again when uh, people around there they try to impose a man in her life she refused that and then the politics came in that even in the place like rani khet which is a, which is not even uh, in a urban area to uh, to give some uh, profit to other people but this place is being politicized and uh, they were digging for some of the minerals there so it is evident that not even a place like rani khet is being uh, spared for uh, because of the purpose of uh, capitalization or industrialization not even that so maya then uh, protested for that and later she fighted for that so again both the characters they find peace with nature they unify with nature and then uh, the question of patriarchal bargain comes in that not even uh, the patriarch the men but the uh, the idea of whole patriarchy that the also the women the women in their lives they try to justify that no you are a women and you don't have any right to live without a man you you, you have to get married toys thrives as much as you want but you can't uh, stay alone then then again both the women they fail to uh, find shelter in men in the uh, husbands or in later in the the men whom uh, the world wants them to get connected to so this is something and and at last we uh, in in the procedure of the whole uh, novel whole art you can say that these two women they in the plethora of nature they get they establish and they attain agency and identity of their own and the collective identity and the individual identity by unifying with nature so now i'd like to conclude that 
women do attempt to live under the shell under the shield of men but nature acts as a major companion to them the men in their lives they fail to give them compassion to give them the peace in their lives but what give them that what they all want is nature then the women's oscillation between agency identity and its lack is majorly because of the subjugation and the desire to have identity as women they want uh, individuality they want their own identity but uh, again they have to suffer from the subjugation from the marginalization so this is the reason why they are being oscillated oscillating between the presence and the absence of these two concepts agency and identity at last i would like to say uh, this is from ariel sella she is an eco feminism uh, we can say she is an eco feminist eco political feminist we can say so she said that nature is embodiment or nature is embodied in the human body we are the part of nature not above in the hierarchy but in the horizontal line so we are not above anything we are equals uh, as i as i compare women or men as feminism or eco feminism does not uh, i can say it does not uh, push men down but they uplift them they uplift women and men both to come to an equal status so uh, they say that we are not in an hierarchy but we are in a horizontal line the genders the ecology the environment everything is in horizontal line so thank you thank you so much thank you rachna okay um now uh we have at least until 9:45 for q and a but because we are not in a shared physical space this gives us the luxury of extending our temporal space that probably made no sense but whatever um who would like to begin our q and a i just have a quick question should i keep the recording going or turn it off for this part if uh everyone is comfortable with having their questions and answers recorded i see no reason to um okay. stop it yeah Would anybody like to start? Um, I could get things going if if that's necessary. Yeah, yeah. Well, hi. <laughs> My toddler just left the room, so it's okay now. Well, thank you very much for the presentations. It was very interesting, even though there were two trends, obviously, like more reading and more producing. Um, I'm a teacher of French, so I have the foreign language uh, uh, component in, in, in embedded in all of this, but I'm also trying to, to bring students to um, talk about things that are not so always easy to talk. So it was very helpful to have like your prompts, Kimberly, which I quickly jotted down on a piece of paper. Um, and I'm in Portland, Oregon, so we're not, you know, we're in a pretty liberal environment here. So the students are quite mature and quite engaged and, and yet sometimes they like the tools. So um, one thing that I, I wanted to um, also offer as a as a track is science fiction. I use science fiction sometimes to reach to those um, topics in an indirect way. Um, unfortunately, it's quite pessimistic. So we, we always fall into that same trend of like, you know, dystopia and post-apocalyptic uh, groups who are trying to survive and things like this. But it's always a way uh, sometimes to have them um, talk about some things like, um, um, Katie, you were using film and things like this that do not say climate change, but kind of mean it. And um, I was wondering if, if others in, uh, uh, in your courses, you've been trying to find also genres or subgenres or like mystery novels or sci-fi to sometimes arrive at the same, uh, at those discussions of climate change. I also, I, I did use some short um, fiction and it did like the it it sort of contributed to that feeling of like oh this is so bleak you know and we all were so we were so sad together i was really trying to find a way to get out of that you know and just to to do something else 
Um, and we did watch some films and I found um, Snowpiercer and Parasite were both helpful in different ways. I don't know, how many people have seen Snowpiercer? Okay. I teach it. Oh yeah, okay. <sighs> Um, my, I, I, you know, I mean, I think this was completely generational, like I'm much older, I have younger kids and all that. And I thought, um, you know, this is so awful to think about this. And they were like, it's a comedy. It was like, it was completely, um, it was completely surprising to me that they read it that way. Um, but I think Parasite really was interesting in terms of getting at it from the side um, and getting at the, the discussions of climate change um sort of without going right into we're talking about climate change it's like what is it that precipitates all this disaster at the end i'm so impressed with your discussion of snowpiercer because i watched it and thought oh this would be so great and this is so bleak um but another one to throw into the mix is um the mad max fury road remake which um it, you know, and I think it sort of it kind of depends on where your students are. I I feel like the green place is just way over your head, but it works really well, I think, with a diverse group of students at community college and like other films. There's a lot of other ways. You know, everybody loves Furiosa and there's there's a whole bunch of other relationships. Um, but the main thing about living in the desert and how water is that precious commodity is another sideways angle in. Um, I haven't taught the entire filming class. I've taught clips of it because some of it is, it is rated R and I feel like some of it is really graphic and you just have to balance that with, you know, everything else that's going on, but that's another one to throw out there. So I was a teaching assistant for uh, Stephanie Lee Menager in the spring and I found two short stories. Uh, this was for a science fiction course, actually. Neither of them, had an environmental focus, but I think they were really helpful for getting students to think of different ways in which um, activism itself can respond to one's surroundings. And those two are um, the one, I'll write them in the chat. The ones who leave Omalas, I believe is the title, it's by Ursula. Laird Gwynn, put that in the chat. And the other ones is the ones who stay and fight by N.K. Jemison. Um, I would actually prefer not to give too much of a plot summary for either one of them because they, uh, a lot of the their uh, power as or is in the uh, ways in which the stories unfold and the surprises that come about that. But I would definitely recommend those as tools for students because uh, that one, each of them generated some very lively discussion. My students also liked experimental, um, maybe, maybe experimental writing isn't quite the right, um, word for this, but um, there was a project out of Columbia University where they made these things called chronofacts, right? And they they pretended they were messages from the future and people found them and then they would read the message and it was, it, and, and they, the messages themselves were not directly about climate change, but what they talked about was about climate change. Like, um, like one, there was one about, I'm giving you directions to my home because we had to move it because of the water, you know, like because of the water rising, like they had to move their homes regularly and, and things like that, that had a little bit of a, like, I mean, kind of fantasy-ish um, element to it. Um, the students liked working with those texts. I just felt like we couldn't do more bleak, you know, if it was bleak, I just wanted to get away just because the students were so, um, they were in that mindset. They were ready to go there at every turn. Um, to Kimberly, where can we access this project? Or is oh, it? Um, I can find it and I'll just send it to all of you. It was so cool. I mean, it's over now. So some of the material isn't as easily available, but I can email it to everyone as long as your um, emails are on there. Yeah, uh, you could probably send it to that uh, email thread I, I sent out earlier this. Oh yeah, exactly, okay. Does anybody else uh, 
want to pose a question to the panelists. I have one, but I would rather, you know, cede the floor to one of the panelists first. I have a question for Rachna if I haven't talked too much already. Go ahead. Um, Rachna, what's the reception? I mean, I'm curious what the reception is to your work in your institution or in any other institutions. I, I'm just curious, like, do you find an audience that's that's interested? Um, and are are there, um, I mean, as far as students, like are the students interested? Are they engaged in women's issues and women in nature? Or um, is there any resistance there to that work? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, this is the topic ecofeminism is the topic uh, I've chosen for my research work. And previously, when I was teaching in Central University of Odessa, after my uh, master's, I was teaching there. Uh, the students were much interested in these issues, okay, the uh, environmental perspectives. And there were some uh, students who even don't know what uh, eco-criticism is and what uh, ecological concerns are. So I was very much distressed to know that they don't even know what it is. So that's why I connected these issues and the place where I live, uh, it is um, definitely in India, it is Jharkhand and I particularly live in Dhanbad and it is a, a area which is a, a coal mining area it is. So since my childhood I have seen that how this place is being polluted and how uh, the capitalization, the industrialization have worked uh, in this area to just pollute the area and the people here which, who are living here they are being uh, I guess they are now uh, as I am 24 25 in these uh, whole years I, I get to know that people are now very comfortable with it they don't have any issues that yes this is this is our lives so I'm I'm just uh, very curious to know that why why this comfort comes into play you have to just stand and say that no you have to do the organization that you have to do something to just to, uh, reduce the pollution which is being here so this environmental concerns were there and uh, and if you say that why uh, women issues then i must say that the place uh, where i live in and the place uh, where i have studied and I have studied again. I have uh, I've done my master's from Central University of Odessa only, where where I was teaching. Then that place is a uh, area where uh, tribal people were living. So the people there, uh, they were very down to earth. Exactly opposite of the place I live in right now. <laughs> so they were very uh, they were very concerned about nature, as the place is uh, uh, a natural uh, a composition of natural habitat. You can say. And that place is being filled with uh, ladies who were working hard to save the environment. And we, when we visited there for an excursion, when we visited there and I heard their opinions, that, that again motivated and inspired me to uh, read and to explore the area. So that is why I have just combined these two, uh, two issues, women and environment. And during my studies, I get to know, yes, there is a, uh, again, there is a branch that is ecofeminism on which I can work on. So I have chosen this. Um, if I could just uh, jump off of some, and have I been pronouncing your name incorrectly? If I have been, I'm-, I'm, I'm I know, I'm, it's Rachna only, yeah. Yeah, you're right. Rachna. Rachna. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, you, there was something in um, what you were saying about this, um, what uh, this this concept I've been hearing more of the years is it's uh, almost like emotional labor that people have to take on when they're confronted with um, uh, ecological issues, and this is a this is a um, resonant with some of the concerns uh, shared by other panelists, such as Kimberly. This despair that uh, mm -hmm. it, it's usually our first reaction to learning about environmental issues and uh, feelings of hopelessness and uh, even a kind of impotence that might arise, feeling as if these, we're at the behest of forces uh, really beyond our individual capabilities to confront. But my question is, is there something perhaps necessary about 
allowing ourselves to feel that despair and not to push it away too soon. Insofar as if we do not go through perhaps this despair, we may accept the first bit of hope that is available to us, which quite frequently is offered to us as a method as of exploitation. I'm thinking particularly of things like greenwashing of companies that will present themselves as being advocates for environmental justice. And yet when you look at their labor practices, not only are they not fair to their workers, but they are quite, uh, have a quite large environmental footprint. So just to synthesize this into one question, is there a necessity and perhaps a use for despair in with regards to ecological, the climate emergency as it's been renamed? Um, I think uh, there should not be any despair, but yes, definitely there should be a concern that yes, this is the state where we are right now and we have to develop, we have to develop it for better. So I don't think uh, there is anything to sit and to cry on as something has been done, it's done. What we can do is we can just improve the situation. We can just plant more trees. We can just do what is needful. So as one of the um, eco-feminists, which I have mentioned, Vandana Shiva, she's, uh, she's against the GM food, the uh, GM uh, food, the processed food, I guess, um, I must say. The, uh, the pesticides, the insecticides, the use of these, uh, we must reduce that and we must uh, just try to improve the situation, I must say. So again, I would like to say that there is no place for despair here. Can I add one, one thing? Sure. Like, like I do feel like it's important to acknowledge the situation, like the damage that has been done, particularly in the United States where um, you know, it's easy to kind of have your head in the sand and especially over the last few years, when my international students come into to my classes, they, um, and, and you point out like, if I put up like headlines from newspapers that show kind of the variety of responses to climate change that we have in the US, sometimes they're shocked about how um, journalists and politicians can talk about climate change as if it doesn't exist. So I wonder if that context matters there, if you're in, a, in an environment where climate change is an accepted fact, where everyone's like, yes, this damage has been done, and this is where we are today, versus the environment that Katie was describing, where, you know, it, it sounds like, Katie, from what you said, that, that you can't necessarily even say climate change exists in your class. Is that right? I mean... Um, I prefer the students to say it first. And I would say um, more of them, more of them do. So uh, I, th I think that is helpful, but it is, um, it, it is tricky when, you know, and usually I can tell based on earlier assignments kind of where people will fall. So I can structure the conversation to be you know, more helpful, but it, it is when you're trying to, to push. And I, I think to your question, John, I'm, I don't know about despair, but I, I think I like the word startle, that I think there's a place for, especially students to be startled by information. And um, what happens with the students who come at least to CMC, to be near the ski area, to be near, you know, all these national parks, we're five hours from Moab and it's not unreasonable for students to take off for the weekend and go to Arches. Um, and so trying to find those connections of, um, do you know that there are uranium mine tailings in Moab that have never been fixed? Anytime you go there, um, do you realize that this is what you're participating in? And let's look at Wallace Stegner's writings. And um, I, I think there is such great value in startling them. Um, and that seems to also kind of, at least where I'm teaching, um, it's, it's a great way to cross the line. It's not something that can be debated again. Um, and then for the students who are, are very invested, you know, it's, it adds to their pile. For students who maybe have come from rural Idaho, um, it, it startles them into thinking about things differently, right? So it's all like a, a little piece of it. 
I feel like I should maybe qualify what I uh, meant by despair. I mean, I agree with Rachna that um, there's no good in just kind of wallowing in self, in feelings of, um, you know, woe is me and feeling very sad about yourself. I mean, because ultimately, of course, that doesn't achieve anything. But I think that there is a something I think very generative, at least about mourning something that you feel like um, you have lost or you have potentially feel like a relationship that you once had to a space is no longer sustainable. And now you have to come to terms with the fact that, you know, I'm from Long Island. Um, I live in Eugene, Oregon now. Um, you know, my mother and her siblings were able to go clamming uh, for a living during the summer. And because of the ocean acidification, that's no longer possible. And I think that, you know, it was important for her at least to mourn the fact that her, the place that she grew up in no longer provided that really deep sense of a connection to the land. And um, I don't know, I, I, do, I just don't think that it's always bad to uh, feel those like complicated and painful feelings when we look out to the world around us and see that it's changing in ways that are making it, you know, less recognizable and less, less, less hospitable, let's say. And I think part of what, what at least several of us are saying is that that, that that feeling of, well, at least I, I shouldn't speak for other people, but that feeling of loss, that feeling of, of, you know, pain at seeing your favorite places or places that you care about diminished or lost or, or damaged. Um, I mean, I think that is useful, but I feel, feel like for my students who are completely first years, um, when many of them had never been to New York City except for a quick visit. And so they get here and in a normal year, they're sort of stunned. You know, they're just sort of like afraid to go anywhere, you know, because New York City can be so intimidating. And then in a pandemic year, they were just stunned into silence. I mean, they were just sitting there, there like completely in just in shock all the time. Um, so it was a really it was a really challenging year to be teaching. And I'm sure we all experienced this disaster. But um, but just figuring out like well, what kind of despair or what kind of loss or what kind of sadness in the classroom can be productive versus what felt like it stunned us all into just, you know, let, let's be sad together, which, which can be productive, but we can't do that, you know, in a writing class for too long or else nobody's writing, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which is tricky. So, um, John, I posted that we kind of switched places because I grew up in Eugene, Oregon, and now I live on part of Long Island, basically in Brooklyn. So yeah, yeah, I, I um we <laughs> talked a little bit about the the uh, horrible uh, wildfires that were on the coast. Oh, yeah. there. Um, and you know that's something that I I bring up to my students, like as you as, as you're probably aware, uh, Kimberly. Like there is, you know, in Eugene, you're not going to encounter too many people that deny the existence of climate change. Maybe in like Springfield, but not in Eugene. Yeah, in Springfield, um, but just for people who don't know, Springfield's like, you know, a hundred feet away. <laughs> so there's two towns that are close together and they have very different ethos where each one has a sort of different sensibility. So go ahead. Um, yes, uh, yeah, thank you for that clarification. That's like, Springfield's like the Trump voter district, but whatever. Um, but, you know, to really bring it home to students, I do draw attention to the fact like, guys, look at the air quality index. If you really don't think, if you really think that climate change is something that you're gonna have to deal with decades from now, just like go outside and breathe in a little bit of the smoke and you'll realize that climate change is something that's already affecting your lives. And who knows what kind of health effects it's going to happen to people in Eugene you know, within a relatively short period of time. Um, this is something I talked to my advisor about because she does work, uh, my advisor is Stacey Limo. She does uh, work on transcorporeality and there's these ways in which we don't even have 
uh, our, our sense of autonomy about our own bi bodies has been violated by, you know, the amount of industry that deposits all these chemicals within us that we really have no control over. Not to, I mean, that's a very, I don't want to end on that note, <laughs> let me say. Well, I want to add one more thing into that, which is that like your environment, I mean, I think, and Annalise's discussion of place and women's role in place was, I think, also connected to this, but, but that ability to bring the environment, like discussions of the immediate environment into the classroom, I think is really important as well. Um, you know, New York City, there's not that, it's not like, like Eugene or Colorado or and Rock and I don't know about the area of India you're in, but but there's not much that feels like nature. You don't feel like you're out or connected when you're here, um, but we do have this kind of insane flooding um, that has that I never remember from even you know 15 years ago, but now happens regularly enough that New York City started sending phone alerts when it rains, which you know in Oregon, you, if you got a phone alert when it rained, it would be every other minute. But now we get alerts because people here have drowned in their basements from flooding, which is, um, you know, in a major US city, that's, I, I don't, you know, from rainstorms, it seems um, criminal that that would happen, but it, it brings that, that you know, how important and how immediate these issues are together with that sense of like, no, this is a literal thing that happens down the street. And so we need to think about, you know, what needs to happen in order to, to make this safe. You know, um, it, it really makes it, I think it makes such a difference for students, you know, bringing in the mention of Moab and bringing in the air pollution, like those things, I think making it more concrete, keep you from that kind of wallowy despair. Right. <laughs> Katie, did you want to, uh, Rachna, did you, uh, either of you like to add something? Um, this is a great discussion, by the way. I'm really enjoying this. Um, no, I just it hit home when you were talking about the fires because we were dealing with that as well. And so it just, I'm thinking in my head about how I might be able to incorporate that. I don't usually teach in the summer when it's the worst. My husband and I bought an air purifier for our condo finally this year because fire season started in June. Um, and just I, my brain is spinning a little bit about how that could be part of something else. Um, but I, I have found that making things as local as possible and um, it is an easier way into someone who might be resistant to um, kind of wanting to hear this information, you know, and I think it's um, it's it's interesting. Like you know, I often teaching first year writing, no one's had that. You're maybe their first class where they're hearing something other than what their parents told them for 18 years of their lives, or 24, depending. Or I have 60 year olds in my class. That's what's amazing about community college. And so sometimes you have 60 year old people saying things that um, you shouldn't have said in the 70s in a classroom. <laughs> 2020 and have to deal with that sort of thing too. And so I, I think um, I, I like your assignment idea, Kimberly, of making it personal to you. Um, it's the, the Carolyn Finney essays are short and so great. They're about minority experiences in national parks. And um, I often evolve that into, okay, now it's your turn to write about your park, but we start first with, again, that idea of startling someone into, oh, like, this is how someone else might, might feel in this park that I've been to that's three hours away, and maybe I'm going on an outdoor education trip, so um, I feel like, wasn't that a bumper sticker, like, a long time ago, right, like, saving the earth by being local or something, so um, I, I think that that way, and it's just really, really powerful, no matter where you are, I mean, I, and just, I'm surprised to find someone else in our call who also lives near a coal mine. Like it changes your whole perspective of how to talk to people and what your local economy is like. And it doesn't change what it does to the planet, but having to talk about it in a new way is definitely challenging, not insurmountable, it's challenging. <laughs> oh, and before we stop, I did put, I put the link to that information in the chat um, to one of the articles about the the project that I mentioned, just so everyone has it. 
Um, would anybody else? Oh, go ahead, Rajna. Yeah, I would just like to uh, share an incident with you, which happened in Odisha only. Uh, there was a hill, or there is a hill, obviously, that is Kanmardan Hill. And uh, that hill has a mythological, uh, mythological connect. And also, uh, that, is, that hill is a source of a very prominent river there, that is Mahanadi. So uh, an industry that is Balco, B-A-L-C-O, Balco, uh, they, they uh, go there for the bauxite mining. But the women there, the women, the tribal women or the Adivasi women, uh, we call uh, the, uh, the tribals Adivasi here. So the tribal women, they stood for it and they call it the rape of nature. You can't do it. And they stood for it. And uh, I would like to quote one of the women there that uh, the name of the woman was Dhanmati. She was 70 years old at that time. And she, uh, she said, we will rather sacrifice our lives, but not Ganmardhan. We want to save this hill, which gives us all we need. So this is what she has done for that hill. And after her, uh, I must say, after her, uh, um, when she stood for it, and then that mining stopped and the hill was still safe. So this is something positive. <laughs> yeah. It seems like when I was, uh, I um, two years ago, I went to India with a group from NYU to um, interview students and faculty at different universities. And I just found that um, the students were so ready to be activists. And so at least the ones that I interviewed, they were so um, sort of charged with enthusiasm for supporting and making their communities better. Um, and um, just this, the, the, some of the students in um, Kerala, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, in the South, um, one of the universities we went to, they were, I was talking to them about um, environmental issues and they were like, of course, this is our home. Of course, we would protect it, you know, in this way that I was just like, oh, this is wonderful, you know, just to, to hear that from students and them so ready to be involved in protecting the, their environments and caring so much about it at, at a young age. It's, it was wonderful. So. All right, that seems like a really nice note to end this discussion on. Thank you all so much. This was really lovely. And um, I hope at the next Pamela, we can all meet in person. So thank you so much. That would be thank great. You, John. John, wait, I have one question to ask before you go. So just stay, sure. sorry. I don't want to cut anybody else off. I just thank you. It was a pleasure to meet everybody and hear about your work and feel excited for some new ideas. So thank you for your time on Sunday. Yeah, of course. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you so much, thank everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, bye, bye. Bye. I'm going to stop recording. I have no... <laughs>